our scripture reading. Uh, we are going to go to the book of Galatians chapter 5. And uh, today we're going to skip a little bit. Uh, we're going to do verses uh, 1, 13, and then 19 to 25. So Galatians chapter 6, or chapter 5, I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then to verse 13. Now you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And then uh, down to 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once ago, uh, we read Galatians 5, 1, 13, and uh, 19 to 25. Uh, and uh, begin with verse 13, that section is titled Life by the Spirit. Uh, so what has happened is, uh, you know, Paul's been talking about several different topics, but he's gotten around to talking about life in the Spirit. And he ended that section with the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and the problem with the fruit of the Spirit, and, and I love that passage, and, and you know, I've preached on it, and uh, it's great stuff, but uh, it can be a little abstract. Uh, so, you know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit includes kindness. Uh, well, you know, how does that play out in life? Um, as they used to say, uh, where the rubber meets the road. And so what Paul does uh, in these first few verses of chapter 6 is he kind of gives some concrete examples of how it is that we uh, live out uh, life by the Spirit uh, and, and how that looks in a concrete way. Uh, it, you know, this is, this is real stuff. This is complicated stuff. And so uh, I want to share those two examples and some of the implications of them. And so we begin with example one, uh, which I just want to tell you up front is very uncomfortable. Uh, and I'm going to come back to, uh, you know, kind of talking about why it's uncomfortable after I read the verse that it's based on. Uh, but uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, uh, <clears throat> right after that chapter 5 section, Paul says this, uh, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So what makes this uncomfortable, of course, is that idea that, uh, that we, not the pastor, but we are given the task of, uh, of helping to follow up with uh, those that are, that are part of the, the church family, the believers, who have, uh, who have got tripped up, or who have fallen away, or, or have, uh, you know, drifted back into sin. Uh, and in the Church of the Nazarene, uh, one of the popular terms uh, that has been used for, uh, for decades uh, is the idea of backsliding, or being backslidden. Uh, and, and we use that terminology, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, and, and this passage tells us that it's uh, our, again, not the pastor's job, but, but each other's job 
to restore that person. And uh, that's what I mean when I say this is uncomfortable. Uh, you know, uh, how many of you feel like doing that? Uh, you, you know, you come to church and you recognize that someone in the church family that, that you've been, uh, you know, growing in the Lord with, that they've, uh, that they've backed away, that they've moved in the wrong direction, that they're doing some things they ought not be doing, and you realize that it's part of your responsibility to do something about it. And immediately, it's like, oh, well, you know, if I do that, they'll be mad at me. Uh, I'm not perfect. Who am I to do that? And, you know, and there's these other passages that talk about not judging one another. And uh, how do I know I'm not just doing that? And, and uh, you know, so it, 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 it's going to be so awkward if I do that. And, and on and on it goes. And it's just a very uncomfortable concept. Um, we don't want to be put in that position. Uh, and if you've ever had to go to someone and kind of confront them, um, you know that it's uncomfortable and awkward. Uh, <clears throat> then they're done that. Um, <clears throat> not, a, not a fun thing to do. Uh, but there it is. Uh, and so, uh, there, uh, one of the great biblical scholars, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, uh, I want to share a couple of things that he said about it. Uh, but as he introduces it, he puts it this way. He says, Paul imagines a hypothetical situation which is, however, not all that infrequent, in which one believer learns that another believer is trapped in some sin. And so I, I love the way he wrote that. You know, Paul uses the term here, if someone is caught in a sin. If someone. So that hypothetical situation. And then he points out, even though it's a hypothetical situation, the reality is not that rare. Uh, we, that, that occurs a lot, uh, and, uh, and we need to be aware of that. But then Boyce goes on to say, uh, and again, the insight is, is just accurate, uh, he says it's a situation that more than any other inevitably reveals the character and maturity of a believer. So how the, the believers deal with a fallen believer, he says, that's what really reveals the character and maturity of the believer. Uh, if they don't do anything, if they do it wrong, uh, that kind of shows that there's some immaturity there, or that there's a lack of Christian character. Um, and so, uh, so this situation, and he says, more than any other, reveals that. Uh, so you want to you know, am I growing in the Lord? Well, see what you do when you're confronted with this kind of situation. Well, then Paul goes on and, uh, and kind of gives us uh, three of those reporter-type answers to questions. Uh, what, who, and how. Uh, when that situation comes up, what should be done? Who should do it? How should it be done? And he does that all in verse 1. Like He's, he's pretty succinct here. But we want to unpack that a little bit. <coughs> so first of all, uh, what, what should be done? And the, the quick answer is, is that Christians should restore the fallen. Uh, and I find it interesting that the word restore that is translated here in, uh, in Galatians, if you go to secular Greek of the day, and you're reading other kinds of stuff, not in the Bible, that's the exact word that they would use if they're talking about setting a broken bone. Uh, and so think about, you know, a doctor setting a bone and, and re restoring it. That's what Christians are supposed to be doing with their brother and sister Christians when they have fallen uh, or when they have backslidden. Um, he points out that... Uh, by the way, that, that, that methodology, if, if any of you had a broken bone, um, I had a bad broken bone. Um, <clears throat> my, my, the two bones in my lower leg uh, snapped in half, both of them, splintered all up, uh, so there was complete separation of both of those bones, uh, nothing firm there. Uh, I landed on the road, I'd been riding my bike, I hit by a car. Uh, landed on the road with a 90 degree turn in my leg that wasn't supposed to be there. 
Uh, but one of the things I learned is that they did surgery, they set the bones, they put everything back together, uh, they even put some of the splinters back into place and everything, did all of that, and then they said, now you wait. Uh, it's going to take a long time uh, for your body, we, we put it in the right place, we can't actually fix it. Uh, and in my perspective, of course, you know, God designed us in such a way <laughs> That our body is going to start healing itself. Uh, but it takes a long time. And they said, by the nature of yours, you know, we can't even let you have one of those walking casts. Uh, you know, because in your case, uh, if we let you put any weight on that at all, you're going to have a shorter leg than the other. So you have to keep all your weight off your leg until it's done. And that's going to take months because it happens to be way down low, far from your heart, and all this other thing. So I spent like six months in a cast, a couple more months uh, not in a cast, but having to keep all the weight off my leg and stuff. Uh, but you had to, it, it was a long, slow process. And, and the author points out that um, sometimes restoring a fallen brother is going to be like that. It, it's not something you do in an instant. Uh, it might take a while to restore them. Uh, and so uh, it even uses the, the Greek verb tense that suggests it's a process, uh, not just a, you know, you know I wouldn't restore him yesterday. Uh, it'd be great if it always worked that way, but uh, it can take a process. So that's what ought to happen. We ought to restore the brother. <clears throat> and of course, the other options, you know, are not doing anything. Uh, or, you know, the other thing you can do is uh, those guys that want to come in. Who wants to do my volunteer to get picked on? Nobody wants to be my volunteer to get picked on. Uh, we'll say Robin. Uh, so if, if I were to catch Robin in a sin, another option would be to come in on Sunday morning and say, Hey everybody, let me tell you what I caught Robin doing. And that's vote on kicking her out. You know, but, but, you know that, that's the approach some people take. They want it, they want it or else they do it less, uh, less direct than that. Oh, I'd never get up front and say that about her. My technique is to go around each person individually and say, Guess what I caught Robin doing? <laughs> that, that's the other way. So, so there's that kind of approach, and then there's the, you know, I'm just going to ignore it because it's awkward and it's none of my business. And, uh, but, but no, the answer is we should restore the fallen. Well, who should do it? Well, he says that those who live by the Spirit, uh, still in verse 1, and he had just talked about that, uh, that, that idea that those who, uh, who, who, you know, when God forgives us, it is by grace. It's not because we fixed ourselves. Uh, and once he forgives us, we are supposed to start growing into his likeness and becoming more and more like us. And we're supposed to, to you know, stop sinning. And, and sometimes there are habits that it takes a little while. And sometimes um, we don't even have the knowledge of all of our sins yet. It, you know, uh, after you've been saved and everything, God says, okay, wait a minute, what about this in your life? What's wrong with that? Oh, trust me. You know, and, and we get taught and we give up those things and more and more. Uh, and he says it's those who live by the Spirit. Uh, those who not only have been forgiven, but those who have started living the way God wants them to. And uh, those, that would include those who exhibit uh, those things like love, joy, peace, you know, the fruit of the Spirit we talked about. Uh, those are the ones who ought to do it. Um, you know, if you're a struggling uh, Christian yourself, and then you're dealing with some sin in your own life, and you're having, pro you know, if, uh, it, it's probably better someone else do it. Um, maybe you can play a part, uh, but uh, let someone else do it. And the third thing he says is the how, um, and the how is kind of a two-part thing. First of all, gently, and secondly, with the awareness that anyone can fall. And so the, the gently word. Uh, also ties back to those of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, that includes that gentleness. Um, but if you want to restore someone gently, think about how that's different from restoring them uh, brutally. Um, or, you know, those of you who have uh, been involved in sports of one kind or another, um, there are different kinds of coaches. Uh, there's the kind of coach where you do something wrong, and he puts the hammer down. 
uh, and, and he can be brutal, and he can cut you up in front of the team, and on and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there's the other kind, uh, who's an encourager, uh, who can come alongside and, and talk to you about, you know, what went wrong, and how this happened, what can we do to improve that, and, and he's, you know, those two different styles. Uh, and Paul is saying to be the gentle kind. Um, you know, we shouldn't go in uh, with a fallen Christian and be harsh. Uh, and, you know, it's like, after what you did last night, you're going to hell, you know, you don't have any idea, you know, you should be coming to church, you have to you know. Uh, that's not the right approach to dealing with a fallen brother or sister, uh, gently. And then, uh, and then in that first verse, he also says, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. And the, the, the scholar says from the context that uh, that watch yourselves, he's really talking about in this context um, that idea, that awareness that anyone can fall. I've shared before the, uh, the saying that's attributed to, uh, to Dwight L. Moody, uh, who sees the rhino, and the guy says, oh, look at that, okay, and he says, but by the grace of God, there go I. Uh, we need to constantly have that attitude. Uh, when we uh, recognize uh, a fallen uh, brother or sister in the Lord, um, we need to remember that it could be us. That, you know, we're not superior to that guy or that gal. Uh, we're not better than they are. Um, but that uh, uh, we could face the temptation. We could have something come into our lives. Something could go. And, and we could fall just like they fell. We are not immune from falling. And that's one of the problems that, you know, we talk about strong Christians and mature Christians, um, and, you know, all you have to do is watch some television uh, about some of the, the great, who have been great leaders of the church, and you find that even they are subject um, to falling sometimes. Uh, and so we need to have that awareness as we deal with others, and it will impact the way we deal with them. Uh, when we recognize that they're going something that we could be going through. Uh, and so that's kind of the how, uh, gently, and with that awareness. Uh, the second example he gives uh, <coughs> uh, is in verse 2. He says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And so the, the second example of what it means to lived by the Spirit, is when we carry each other's burdens. And, and by the way, uh, I put the, the word dependent there in parentheses. Uh, you know, we're celebrating uh, tomorrow as a nation Independence Day. And uh, one of our nation's values is independence. And, and we have let that filter down so that rather it just meaning we are no longer dependent upon Great Britain, uh, it, we've let that filter down our lives that we all strive to be independent. I don't want to have to depend on anyone. Uh, I'm going to support myself. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need anyone's help. You know, we, we hate to ask people for help. Um, it, it, you know, we think it's awkward and, and it it's, uh, takes a blow to the pride to do that and so on and so forth um, because we want to be dependent. In this passage, or independent, but this passage is really saying that we need to have some dependency. Uh, the reality is, I thought about it after I prepared the slides, um, one of the words that some people are using is interdependent instead of independent. Uh, and the difference between interdependent and dependent is dependent uh, usually implies a, a one-way thing. Uh, usually we talk about someone being dependent, we don't, we don't usually mean that, that they're dependent on each other. It usually means that one person is dependent on the other. Uh, but we're actually talking about interdependent, where I depend on you and you depend on me. And it's a two-way street, not a one-way street. Uh, and so, uh, you know, mentally scratch that and change it to interdependent. Um, but um, <coughs> independence from Great Britain, that's one thing. We celebrate that tomorrow. Uh, independence from one another, God just didn't design us that way. Uh, the church family is supposed to be interdependent upon each other. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, carrying each other's burdens, 
Uh, again, what does that look like? Well, I want to give you an example uh, from my life um, <coughs> that carrying each other's burden is like when our Pinto died. Uh, we did not have a horse. I'm talking about the Ford. Uh, and ours, it, it died. Uh, we, it was during our seminary years. Uh, we got up and Robin worked, uh, actually she worked at, uh, at Nazarene headquarters, uh, which uh, owned land and her office was like next door to the seminary. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we would ride to work together. Uh, she would go to work, I'd go to school. Uh, and one morning our Pinto was just having a hard time making it. And it had been going downhill for a while. And it was spittering and sputtering and backfiring. And uh, it, it almost looked like, you know, if the, the director's doing a comedy movie. And this is the car he would pick for the movie. You know, it'd go bam, boom, you know, and it worked pop, pop, you know. And, uh, it was so bad that uh, it was a, a stick shift. Um, I would have to kind of like rev the engine and get some power up and then ease out the clutch in order to make it over the, the hump in the road. Like if you're crossing an intersection, uh, the roads so that they drain, or just to get over that little hump, had to do that. So we got about halfway to work and I pulled into a garage, talked to them, they are gonna keep it for the day. We called someone that came and got us, took us to, our, to, to work at school. End of the day, we go back there and the guy says, well, we just can't help you. Uh, it's just, that, that old fashioned word, it's just worn out. Um, now we could put a new engine in it if that's what you want, but that's the only thing that would help in this situation. He said, the truth is, I hope you can get it home. How far do you live? You know, it's like, well, we live about three miles from here, or more like a mile and a half, I guess it was. Um, <clears throat> so we managed to get it home. Um, but so then what happens? Uh, well, you know, people at school have heard the story, I got picked up, and this, that, and the other, and uh, I went to church with several other seminary students, and word gets around. So after a day or two, uh, the pastor calls and says, I hear your car died. Yep, it's, it's gone, you know. Uh, he says, do you have a plan? He says, well, actually, you know, when we got married, um, we sold my car and kept Robbins, and this was her car that died. Uh, but my dad bought my car as a second car to drive back and forth to work only. And so he called me when he found out and said um, that he'd been driving it for a couple years and, and he would just give it back to me. But we have to go to Michigan to get it, and we're going like next week, whatever, you know, the other week. Uh, and he says, well, I'll tell you what, um, we want you, why don't you take my car for the next week and a half till you go get yours? And, and I said, well, you know, you've got two cars, but you know, your wife, you know, isn't that going to be a big hardship? And he didn't say anything right away. And he says, well, you know, to tell the truth, it's going to be kind of inconvenient. Uh, but he said, the truth is, um, you need one car more than my wife and I need two cars. And so take mine until you go get yours. And so we did that. Um, well, that's been, you know, 30 years or whatever. Uh, something I've never forgotten. Uh, he didn't have to do that, uh, but he did. And in my mind, as, even as I read this passage, I thought, that's what he was doing. Uh, you know, Pastor Ken was helping to carry my burden. Uh, he, he, was, he was, you know, stepping up. He was putting himself out. He was inconveniencing himself. Uh, because that's what Christians do for one another. They share each other's burden. Uh, and so, uh, an example is like when our Pinto died. Uh, but it's not only like when our Pinto died. It's not only those physical, uh, you know, secular type, materialistic needs kind of things that we're talking about. Uh, it also includes uh, those spiritual and emotional burdens that we carry. Uh, we need to help carry those burdens too, including the one that we talked about in verse 1. That idea of, of being fallen and having, you know, that, that's part of what it means to carry each other's burden. Uh, if, if my burden is I have a new sin burden, uh, it's partly your job to help me get through that. Or if someone's going through a great temptation, 
Um, you know, and that, that is the key uh, to the success of, of AA. Uh, that idea that they lean on each other and help each other, and when someone is, is really struggling, they can call their sponsor and get that support. Uh, the author says, uh, this James Boyce that I mentioned earlier, um, he, he points out that uh, that is great, and the church ought to be better at it than they are. Uh, if any organization ought to be better at supporting one another and helping one another and not just being judgmental and, and you know, they ought to be the people who come alongside uh, and help. So if someone calls and, and tells you that they're struggling with something, instead of judging them for what they're struggling with, uh, you should come along and give them support and help them get through it. Um, so it's not just those, you know, uh, they lost their job, we're going to give them some groceries, uh, you know, his car broke down, we're going to loan him my car. It's not just those kinds of things. It's also the spiritual and emotional things uh, that impact people's lives that we need to come alongside them in. Uh, I want to move on uh, to the next couple of verses. Uh, verses 3 and 4. Uh, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. So it, it almost seems like uh, Paul just changed subjects all of a sudden. He just, uh, you know, just jumped onto another topic. Uh, but again, these actually connect up. What he's actually talking about are two errors that might interfere with us doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, if we're going to live by the Spirit and do these things like uh, restore the fallen and like carry each other's burdens, the kinds of things that could help mess us up are the two things he talks about here. And the first one was conceit. Uh, those of you who um, think you're something when you're not. Again, that, that pride that comes around uh, and you know you have a, a, a Christian colleague uh, that succumbs to temptation, and you kind of get puffed up. And, yeah, they're weak. They're not strong like me. And we need to remember that uh, that we have the grace of God working in our lives, and that's the only thing that, that just keeps us from falling all the time. Um, uh, one guy um, was uh, some some pastor that told the story that. Um, he was constantly talking about um, what he was going to accomplish over the next few years. And uh, it was pretty grandiose, pretty ambitious stuff. Um, and it seemed a little arrogant. And the, and the person <laughs> comes to him and he says, You know, you're talking big, but you know, you just need to know that without God, you're nothing. And the pastor smiled and said, Exactly, but I'm not without God. And that's what makes the difference. Um, God is with me. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure we don't fall into that conceit that where we think we're really something. But in reality, uh, we're just like the other guy. Uh, by the grace of God, uh, you know, we're, we're getting along. And the other, of course, is the comparisons. Um, he talks at the end of this verse um, that we need to, to look at our lives the way we live it um, alone not compared to how someone else is living. Um, there's, a, there's a proverb, not a biblical proverb, but a great proverb that I love is, uh, never accept bad for good because worse came along. Think about that. Never accept bad for good because worse came along. So you know, imagine uh, somebody cooks something for you and you take a bite and it's not very good. In fact, it's horrible. And uh, and you say, you know, they say, how is it? It's like, well, you know, it's not all that good. It's, oh, yeah, eat this. You take a bite, you throw up, you know. And it's like, well, see, you know, at first this wasn't so bad, was it? It was actually pretty good compared to the second dish I served you. Uh, and sometimes we do that. Uh, we'll look at people's lives and we'll say, well, 
You know, they, they do this and that, and I don't. You know, I'm, I'm better than that. At least I don't do that. Uh, and so that's what he's talking about. You know, we, we need to, uh, to kind of self-check ourselves, judge ourselves, based on our relationship with God and His standards, not on how the people around us are doing. Uh, that's not how we get judged. This isn't a, uh, you know, I guess there are those uh, competitions where um, whoever turned, whoever was, did it the best is the winner. And, and then like in school even, they, they have some of those things. Uh, maybe a scholarship award or something. But then for the rest of the, the ordinary grades, uh, everybody who does the work gets the grade. You don't have to be better than everybody else. You have to just meet the marks. Uh, and so he's telling us that too, not to compare people. And that especially uh, comes into play uh, in this topic that we're talking about. Um, that again, if we're thinking about a, a Christian brother or sister who has fallen, it's easy for us to uh, develop that conceit because we're comparing ourselves to them. Well, I'm not like those Christians who did this and that and, and fell and got drifted away from the Lord. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm better than that. I'm pretty good, you know. And, uh, so we need to get away from that. Uh, and then, uh, in, a, in almost a surprise twist, Galatians 5, 6, 5, uh, for each one should carry their own load. Now, when I say that, each one should carry their own load. Doesn't that seem the opposite of what we said a few minutes ago? About carrying each other's burdens? Which is it? Well, there's a couple different ways of looking at it. Um, uh, but the, the actual definitions of the Greek words that translated into the words burdens and loads uh, gives us one of the answers. And that is, they, weren't, they were very different words. Uh, for example, the word burden uh, would be the word they would use if they were talking about the, the freight load on a ship. This is the ship's burden. This is the ship's load. Uh, well, you kind of imagine that the loads that ships carry are kind of big. And the word translated load here is the word they would use if they were talking about, um, you know, if a Roman soldier tells you to uh, get up and carry his pack, uh, the word pack is the word for loads. Uh, like each person has their own backpack, carry it yourself. Uh, when you've suddenly been dumped on uh, with a freight load, that's when we need to jump in and help one another. And so kind of another twist, and, and this is my thought, uh, maybe I'm off the base here, um, but I think there's kind of a two-way street, and it almost sounds unfair, where, where God is telling us, on the one perspective, uh, it's my job to be on the lookout and help you carry your loads. But I'm supposed to work as hard as I can to not expect you to carry my load. Um, you know, I should try, um, you know, and there's another passage where Paul talks about it. Um, you know, if I'm capable, uh, I need to work and try to provide food for my family so that we don't have to take the food that you guys want to give. Give it to somebody else because I've got my own. But at the same time, I want to give so that those who can't get their own can have their own. Uh, and so it's kind of one of those two expectations. We're expected to, to give but not just so that we can be part of the package that we can have and give it back to us. Um, we want to do our best to carry our own load uh, while having the expectation upon us to carry each other's load. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a paradox there, uh, but it has to do with, uh, and so, you know, if, if you, and, and that's the, uh, the difficulty, uh, when you need help, accept help. That, you know, we're supposed to. But don't just be lazy and, and want other people to do it for you. Uh, that's where the difference is. So that's uh, Galatians 6, uh, 1 to 5 for us.